So thank you very much. Now the, the, it's being recorded. Thank you very much, Monica, for reminding me. Yes. So uh, we were discussing the first problem sheet. So the first assignment here was to take the prove that the Lorentz transform matrix has a, a, a nice form given by hyperbolic functions. And that was relatively easy. Basically, you have to use the standard formula. And then substitute V from this formula over here. So first gamma is one over one minus V squared, which is one minus square root of one minus, uh, and we can write the hyperbolic tangent as hyperbolic sine divided by hyperbolic cosine. That's very useful here. Hyperbolic cosine is positive, so it can go to the numerator uh, without a square. Uh, and we are left with the square root of cosh squared theta minus sin h squared theta. And that's one, so this is just the cosh function. Okay, so altogether this is cosh. This is minus gamma, which is cosh, uh, times v, which is tangent. So we are left just with sin hyperbolic and the same here. So I believe this is this is rather simple. Mm. Then the second part was fairly easy. We were supposed to prove that theta two of minus v is minus theta of v of v. This is just a calculation or exercise. I don't think there is much point in showing the derivation. And then there was the third problem. Uh, the third problem was to show the additivity of that. So we have we have three uh, frames, and we are supposed to show that the rapidity from A to B plus rapidity from B to C is theta A to C. And that's again a calculation or exercise in the end. Uh, you just take the formula we have derived before, divided by y minus v a b plus half log one plus v b c over one minus v b c. So you see that theta is another way to parameterize the velocity, uh, which takes values from minus infinity to plus infinity and has the advantage of being strictly additive. We just will see it here. So adding two logarithms gives us the logarithm of the product. So we end up with one plus VAB, one plus VBC over one minus VAB, one minus VBC, which is equal to half logarithm one plus VAB plus VBC plus VAB VBC over one minus VAB minus VBC plus VAB VBC. And this looks a bit mysterious yet. Uh, now there's two ways we, we could deal with that. Um, one of them is simpler. We could simply write down the expression for the right-hand side. Uh, using the standard addition formula, but there's a more tricky version. Basically, we have to realize that there is this expression here in the numerator and the same thing in the denominator. So what we can do is to rewrite everything in this way. Uh, VAB plus VBC divided by 
one plus V L B C B C uh, and here we get one plus and here we got one minus V A B plus V B C divided by one plus V A B V B C. Uh, what has happened here? Uh, yeah, so we have used this pref this one plus VAB, VBC as a prefactor in both numerator and denominator. We are then left with this expression over here. Uh, and then we can simplify this, uh, this ratio uh, because we have pulled out exactly the same prefactor. And we are left with that. And here now we recognize something. This is basically one plus V. A C over uh, this is basically one plus V A C divided by one minus V A C. That's the uh, here we can apply the velocity addition formula. Uh, sorry, this is a little bit messed up. Plus V A C. Yeah, and that's basically theta AC. So that was a little bit more difficult than the previous one. Um, Any so questions? Can you hear me? Can you hear yes. Me? yes, yes, I can so, hear you. So I wanted to say that why don't we directly start with the velocity addition formula and then substitute everything in terms of tan H, uh, like the hyperbolic tan function, and then we realize it that it's nothing but tan A plus tan B formalism, right? It's absolutely possible. That's another way to do to mm -hmm. to solve it. But this is the one I I, I did in my notice. But ah, okay. it's absolutely it's absolutely possible to to go from the other direction. So we begin mm -hmm. by VAC being uh, equal to VAB plus VBC over one plus uh, VAB VBC. and then we might substitute uh, the expression for these velocities in terms of rapidities, and then use the proper hyperbolic functions formula. Absolutely possible. I'm not sure if it's simpler than that, possibly. Yeah, but it's also possible. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because I found this one a bit more simpler because uh, this directly gives us the formula of tan uh, mm -hmm. theta AB plus tan uh, theta BC. And on uh, right left-hand side, we have tan theta AC. So it's just the inverse of like it, it's just yeah. Yeah. So the only thing is that you somehow need to remember the, the uh, formula that formula, yeah. This one. Yes. You yes. have to remember that formula. If you know it, then yes. of course you can go from this direction and then it's actually it might be, be in fact a little easier than this method I have shown you. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's perfectly okay. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, okay, if not, then we go to the next formula. Uh, to the next problem. Uh, the next problem was the time dilation formula. So let me draw a picture. Uh, this will be P one frame. Let's call it P. And on top of that, we've got another frame. Let me use the blue color for the other one. Yeah, so the second frame is moving with some kind of velocity with respect to the first one. Uh, and I'm using tilde as the uh, marker of the appropriate components. So let's call this one Q. And here's the situation. We've got two clocks. Uh, I will use this reddish color for this clock associated with uh, P. So there is a clock over here. I will try to paint its word line. 
that's clock number one, we call it CP. And at some point it shows the proper time T. And then we've got another clock. I will use a different color for this one, maybe this color. And also shows the time T at some point. Okay, and the question is basically derive the time duration formula. So according to uh, observer C, uh, sorry, I need to do one more thing. This is the clock CQ. So according to the observer uh, P, a clock, this clock CQ is actually running slower uh, than our clock. And let's see how, why this happens. So, um, yeah, so we've got the, um, let's think about the position of the uh, event of, of the Q clock uh displaying time t uh in q this is basically t zero uh let's try to transform this back into uh into the frame p so that's that corresponds to gamma, gamma v, gamma v gamma times t o, and this gives us x zero, x one. Uh, this is with a plus because we are expressing uh, the x zero coordinate in terms of of the tilde coordinate. So we get. It doesn't really matter. What we get is uh, gamma t, gamma t v. We are not so much interested in x one. We are interested in the time coordinate. So this is equal. Uh, so t as measured in in p is equal to gamma t, uh, and that's. E divided by one minus V e squared. So that's larger than T. So it appears that according to the P frame, uh, the ticking of the clock Q happens somewhat later than the ticking of the clock CP. Uh, but what, what about the point of view of the, uh, of the, Q observer. So let's let's try to figure out how this observer sees the same situation. So uh, in P, the ticking of the clock is again uh, of the CP clock. This is the CQ clock. The ticking of the CP clock happens at T zero. That's CP. We perform the Lorentz transform to x not uh, tilde x1 tilde, which is gamma minus gamma v minus gamma v gamma on t0, and that will be gamma t minus gamma t v. So it turns out that, again, uh, the ticking of p according to q happens at a slightly later moment. That at first looks a bit inconsistent, but in fact, there is nothing inconsistent about that. The reason why this may happen is that both frames have very different notion of simultaneity. So uh, if, if the two observers try to argue, hello guy, uh, P may claim that, sorry, I, I, I have seen very clearly that the ticking of your clock is simultaneous with ticking of my clock 
uh, at time tp slightly larger, larger than t, q simply will not agree that this is a proper measurement because these two events, according to, he, to, to him or her, are not simultaneous and vice versa. So that's why both of them can claim that the others, others clock uh, actually runs slower than the, the, the one they're using. And there is no inconsistency here. Uh, any questions to the time dilation formula? Okay, I don't see um, any. So, Professor, sorry, I just remembered one thing. So, I just wanted to say that um, in this frame of reference, we are not talking about which frame has accelerated to uh, have this form of velocity, right? We are just assuming that there are two frames which have this, uh, like they both are inertial frames and one has a velocity, right? Yes, uh, we are talking that there are two inertial frames and the second one has a velocity V. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, the, the frame Q has velocity V with respect to the frame P, or to say the same thing differently, the frame P has the velocity of minus V with respect to the frame Q. That's mm -hmm. the same thing. Yes, uh, the only thing that I was thinking is that uh, when we are talking about these velocities, at that time, even if they, like, if they want to come in one frame with respect to the other, so let's say P wants to come in Q's frame, then there is some form of acceleration which we have to consider, right? Because no. I think so. Uh, okay, this would only be the case if they tried. At the moment, they're all moving along straight lines and with constant yes. velocity. I'm assuming that there is no acceleration whatsoever. They, they just pass each other at one single point, but that's it. They're not slowing down. Okay. In any way. Okay. 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 Thank you. There is no acceleration involved. Okay. So let's go to the lecture. Mm -hmm. So last time we were discussing coordinate transforms in manifolds, and there's a few more problems I'd like us to do. Uh, okay, here's my notes, yeah. So let me let me remind you about the methods of changing of coordinates. Uh, I wasn't I didn't want to do it, but since I had a question about it, methods of of changing of coordinates. Uh, so. The general formula was derived in the last uh, lecture, but there is special formulas you can use for vectors, uh, one forms or tensors of valence two, with tensors with two indices. So uh, when you have a vector, then this transforms into a vector. Uh, we have a coordinate system X alpha, and we transform it to some kind of Y alpha bar with Y alpha bar being a function of x alpha and vice versa. We assume that this is invertible. So this transforms to alpha bar. Uh, I don't like this thing here. Uh, equal to uh, j alpha bar let's say alpha x alpha. And this thing here is basically the matrix of derivatives at a particular point. Again, vectors live at a particular point. Uh, if we assume that this vector uh, has a matrix representation from x zero to x three, then this simply means that our new representation will be the product of j with this vector. So there's a matrix formula for that. Uh, there is something similar for the one forms. Mm. What you use here is basically dx alpha over dy beta kappa alpha. And if this was j, then we call this j to minus one. Uh, 
And in that case, we can write this formula as kappa bar equal to kappa j2 minus one, where kappa is a horizontal vector instead of a vertical one. Mm, and then there's formulas for tensors. Uh, so a tensor T alpha beta transforms into T alpha beta equal to T alpha beta dy alpha bar over dx alpha dx beta over dy alpha beta bar. Uh, in a sense, these formulas are, are, are easy to guess. Uh, because we know we need to get an alpha bar here, which means that we have to uh, contract alpha with something, but the proper thing to contract it with is uh, an index without a bar. So an index corresponding to X. So we have to use X here and Y alpha bar over here. And for a lower index, we have to uh, perform the contraction with X beta. So Y beta bar has to be in the uh, denominator. And this means that T can be written as j t j to minus one. Uh, you can basically ma massage this formula to this type of matrix form. Uh, for lower index things, uh, what happens is that we get the alpha beta dx alpha over dy alpha bar dx beta over d y beta bar. Remember that these formulas over here, the ones which I will here mark with blue, uh, these are the most important ones in the sense of being the most uh, versatile. You can use, use them also with uh, objects with more indices. But for index two, you can use the matrix representation as well. And what this means here is somewhat more tricky. Uh, you get J to minus one transposed T J to minus one. Mm, yeah. And then there is also an upper index matrix formula T alpha beta equals T alpha beta equals T alpha beta D Y alpha bar over DX alpha D Y beta bar over DX beta. That's the general formula. And this is equivalent to T bar is equal to J T J transpose. Again, it's the blue formula, which is the most important one in a sense, but again, it has a simplified matrix form. But on top of that, we also had We also talked about a different method, which we can use for forms and, and metric, and, and also for the metric or tensors of balance zero two. Namely, we can always write our uh, one form as formally kappa zero plus the dx zero, kappa one dx one. This is the basis uh, of the space of covectors or one forms uh, connected with our coordinates. And the transformation is very easy. Uh, you just express X zero as a function of Y's. And then what you have here is basically uh, DX zero over DY zero bar, DY zero bar plus dx0 over dy1 bar, dy1 bar plus, and the same goes for all others.
for, for all other components. And what we are supposed to do in the end is just to uh, clean up a, a little bit this expression and obtain an expression of this form. dy free bar and this will be our new components in practice this is very often the the, 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 the simplest way it also works for 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 the metric which is a tensor of balance zero two we write everything basically as a square here plus let's say 2g zero one dx zero x1 uh, g is symmetric so the term g01 dx0 dx1 is the same as g10 dx1 dx0 we just write it in this way and then we have more terms we perform the same type of substitution again we need to reshuffle the terms uh, and express everything as g0 bar 0 bar 0 bar dy0 bar square plus 2g0 bar 1 bar dy0 bar dy1 bar plus and this is again a very convenient method for tensors of rank or of valence zero two mm, and now we will do a few examples for that uh, example number one will be the Rindler's accelerating frame So Rindler's accelerating frame or Rindler's space-time is a very interesting construction. It roughly corresponds to a frame which has a uniform acceleration in special relativity. So you've got a non-inertial frame which is accelerating with the same acceleration in the same, in one direction. That's, that's something you can easily imagine in Newtonian gravity. If you did a proper classical mechanics course, the description of mechanics in non-inertial frames should also be included and i want to show you the special relativity counterpart of of this construction it's a little bit different from what you might at first expect so let's begin with the minkowski space with the standard special relativity space relativity space it has a metric which is very well known it's minus dt squared plus dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. We will also refer to this as x0, x1, x2, x3. But we introduce another coordinate system, sigma x, y, a, defined in the following way, t is equal to a, hyperbolic sine of sigma z is a hyperbolic cosine of sigma so we haven't changed all the uh, we don't change all the coordinates just two of them so it's a relatively soft change of coordinates but still it, it's a coordinate change uh, okay so let's transform the metric first uh what we will do is we will use again the the method with expressing the differentials of t and z with the differential differentials of a and sigma because we have it already here so dt is da hyperbolic sine of sigma plus hyperbolic sine of sigma plus sorry plus a hyperbolic cosine of sigma d sigma and dz is da hyperbolic cosine of sigma plus a hyperbolic sine of sigma d sigma that's just taking the total derivative of this formula and now we, we need to know what minus dt squared plus dz squared is because we, we leave x and y untouched we don't have to worry about it but it's minus dt squared plus dz squared we would like to understand in terms of our new variables 
So what we have is minus dA hyperbolic sine plus A cos sine V sigma squared plus A dA cos sigma plus A hyperbolic sine sigma D sigma squared. Uh, okay, the simplest method is just, just to perform the square operation directly. We get this, the cross product minus a squared cos squared sigma d sigma squared plus the a squared cos square sigma plus two sin a sigma cos sigma a g a d sigma plus a squared hyperbolic sine squared sigma d sigma squared. Okay, that's relatively easy now. Uh, so this term and this term just cancel out. Uh, here we've got cosine hyperbolic squared minus sine hyperbolic squared, so this is one. Here we have minus cosine hyperbolic squared plus sine hyperbolic squared, which is minus one. So in the end, the result is very nice. It's the a squared minus a squared d sigma squared. So the metric tensor is minus a squared d sigma squared plus dx squared plus dy squared plus uh, d a squared. So that's the form of the metric tensor. Any questions? We'll talk a little bit more about these coordinates in the in the next few minutes, uh, but now I wonder what you if the transformation was clear. Okay, I don't hear any questions, so let's go to the next topic. Uh, so let's think more about this transformation the physical interpretation of the coordinates. Uh, so we take observers corresponding to uh, constant spatial uh, coordinates x, y, and a. Uh, what do they behave like? So mm, let's try to understand them in, in, in the proper Cartesian coordinates. So x mu of uh, a x mu of sigma x y a that's again our coordinate transform uh, this is a in hyperbolic sigma x y a sigma we can consider this a curve parametrized by sigma with these things fixed so then we calculate the tangent vector. That will be a cos sigma zero zero a hyperbolic sine sigma. Uh, 
is it the the proper fall velocity of these uh, of these observers unfortunately not because it's not properly normalized let's calculate that uh, that's basically minus this guy squared plus this guy squared so this is minus a squared cos squared sigma plus a squared sin h squared sigma and that's minus a squared okay this is constant along each of these of these curves but it's not minus one in general except for some observers so let's introduce the proper time for each observer the proper time for each observer is relatively easy to calculate uh, we just have to stretch it appropriately so we introduce tau equals a times sigma and now dx mu over d tau is d sigma over d tau dx mu over d sigma uh, d sigma over d tau is 1 over a and here we've got a cos let's say tau divided by a 0 0 a sine hyperbolic tau divided by a which is cos tau by a 0 0 sin h tau divided by a and that is our four velocity uh, this four velocity is obviously not constant so these observers are accelerating now the question is how much are they accelerating well we have to calculate the derivative again with respect to tau this time and this is relatively easy because we're talking about hyperbolic functions we get one over a sin hyperbolic tau over a zero zero cos hyperbolic tau over a that's the four acceleration vector uh, the length of this vector so a mu times a mu this is a spatial vector and its length is positive it's equal to one over a squared so it's constant during the whole motion moreover it's obvious that the acceleration is directed along the z-axis so each observer is accelerating with a constant velocity one over with a constant acceleration one over a squared in the direction of z so each of the observers with constant spatial coordinates is in fact accelerating with a constant uniform acceleration although the acceleration itself depends on the observer it depends on the a coordinate basically mm, so basic so the the acceleration is uh largely well, let's do it this way one over a uh, it might have been a bad, bad idea to use the letter a here but well so be it so a without an index is a coordinate in, in our coordinate system a mu is the acceleration uh, any questions to the derivations so far um so are you going to discuss uh this thing even further or are you going to end, end it here because then i can ask one question because i don't know if you're going to discuss uh, this a being as a constant coordinate but still there is some form of acceleration with respect to this a coordinate uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question we will talk more about this coordinate system in, in a second at okay. the moment all I'm claiming is that we have shown that for each so we have shown that for each uh, observer marked by constant x y and a we have uh, this observer is actually undergoing a constant acceleration in the same direction although the value of this acceleration depends on the a coordinate um, but when you say that 
there is an acceleration with respect to the z coordinate so at that point uh, this is not like the coordinate system which we are using over here right so when you say uh, it's, it's okay we we still have our old t x y z coordinate system yes. which is cartesian mm -hmm. okay. and these calculations are done in this cartesian coordinate system basically okay yeah so that's how we are saying that in this z coordinate there is some form of acceleration right? yeah okay. yes exactly it means that in this cartesian coordinates there is no y or z component of this for acceleration and just There's one question yes so what is the intuitive representation of a then of like what? not the acceleration not the acceleration this a as a coordinate what is the a, this a as a coordinate yeah uh it's okay let's go back to the we'll see it in a second but let's go uh, then professor it's okay we can see it later Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So there is something very interesting about these coordinates. Uh, so one thing that that is fairly easy to see from the form of the of, of the coordinates. Let's go back to layer six. If we assume that a is positive and sigma is any number whatsoever this is a, this is what people usually assume it's pretty clear that this coordinate system doesn't cover the whole space time why uh, because look uh, we can calculate let's go to the next slide We can calculate z squared minus t squared, which is basically z minus t times z plus t. That's equal to a squared, and that's always positive. Uh, let's for a second forget about the x and y coordinates and just focus on t and z. So we are in. Cartesian coordinates in Minkowski. This is T. This is Z. Uh, so this condition that Z square of minus T square is positive, it basically cuts it cuts the space time into four wedges, so to say. And it, it is only true in this wedge over here. Oh, let's write this way. Or this one over here. And this, this means that our coordinate system simply does not reach uh, these two wedges of the space time. It cannot. In fact, people usually assume uh, that the the uh, regime of the, the the domain of these coordinates is just one of these wedges. Let's say this one. This actually this, this is actually seen easily in the coordinate transform functions. Let's have a look here again. So. T, Z is obviously positive because it's given by the hyperbolic cosine function, which is strictly positive. T, on the other hand, can take any values, positive or negative, but Z has to be positive. And on top of that, uh, T squared minus, uh, Z squared minus T squared needs to be positive uh, in this map. So let's go back here. The condition that Z squared minus T squared is positive uh, is true only over these two edges, but the additional assumption that Z is positive means that we're only covering this part of the space-time. So it's not a global coordinate system. It's the first example we study of a coordinate system which is not global. There is a big chunk of space-time which is not covered by this, these coordinates at all. Mm, okay. 
uh, the observers themselves, let me use green color for them. Uh, they follow hyperbolas. If you look carefully at the at the way these functions look like, uh, the constant time slices, the slices of constant sigma, have pretty much this form. This is sigma equals to constant. And this is a equal to constant. So you see uh, a is a coordinate which which is a spatial coordinate, but it's not exactly equal to Z. It's equal to Z when we are at, at time T equal to zero. Here, these two coordinates A and Z uh, coincide, but in general, they don't. Uh, the, the constant A uh, curves look like hyperbolas, which cut through Z at particular points. And then A equal to, equal to constant uh, curves are basically the word line of these accelerating particles. Uh, is it more or less clear what, what is the role of A? Uh, yes. So I had one uh, doubt here that what if we have this T square minus Z square as a parameterization, then we will cover the whole, like not the whole space, the other part of space, right? Uh, let me go. Uh, Unfortunately, that's difficult. It would be difficult to do it with these mm -hmm. hyperbolic functions. You see? Mm -hmm. well, let's go back here. Uh, the problem is that you can't really do it because you've got an A here. Uh, yes. So, for example, what I was trying to say is that instead of writing T as A sin H sigma, yeah. We can write it as cos s, the cos h sigma and as g as a sin h sigma. Yes, that's possible. Then you would get another. I understand that in this case you would get a coordinate system which indeed covers this part. Yes, not it's the possible. Whole space, yeah. Yes, yes, but look, uh, you will still need four different coordinate systems to cover the whole space time, mm -hmm. and actually you would yes. still have these lines here not covered by any of them. Uh, it's absolutely okay. it's absolutely possible. You would have four coordinate systems, but you'd also need some kind of transitional maps uh, charts which cover these lines. But in principle, it's possible. Uh, we will work a little bit more on Schwarzschild geometry, where this type of tricks will will play very similar tricks in producing okay. different coordinate systems here. But at the moment, I want to focus on this one. The okay. first message I wanted to give you is that there is a counterpart of uniformly accelerating frame. In special relativity, but it's kind of different from what you expect. First of all, notice that there is a small paradox here. Uh, each of these guys is accelerating. Moreover, the distances between these uh, observers is held constant. You can see it in the metric itself. If you look at the metric tensor, uh, the metric tensor doesn't depend on time. Difference between distance between two neighboring observers with constant a's is constant. It's just dA squared, uh, or, or, this, or just dA. However, uh, they're not accelerating uniformly in the sense that the acceleration of, of observers very close to this point zero must be much larger than the acceleration here. So in order to maintain the same distances between these observers, they should not accelerate at exactly the same rate. Rather, the ones which are here on the very beginning have to accelerate very much. And the ones which are further away along the z-axis has to have smaller acceleration. So that's very different from Newtonian expectations when in order to maintain the same distances between each of these observers, they would have to sort of uh, move exactly with the same acceleration at every, every possible moment. So here, the situation is a bit different. Uniformly accelerating does not mean that every observer has the same acceleration. Quite the contrary, there is a, 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 an obvious profile of acceleration they have to have. 
which is non-trivial. Uh, okay, so yeah, but that's not the only interesting thing that happens in this space-time. There is something more interesting, which you might not notice at first, and this has something to do with the way light propagates here. Uh, so as you remember, light propagates along null geodesics. Uh, if you forget about the X and Z coordinates, that correspond basically to lines at 45 degrees with respect to Z and X. Now imagine that something interesting happens here. For example, I don't know, a supernova explodes. It sends a powerful electromagnetic signal. The signal then propagates, propagates in the Z direction. And what about these observers? Can they observe this thing happening? The answer is that no, they will never see this. You see, the world lines, uh, as these observers accelerate, the world lines asymptotically, uh, asymptotically uh, reach this, this particular photon world line, and they will be never able to, uh, to register this photons emitted at these moments, and vice versa. Imagine that one of these observers should some emit some photons, I don't know, uh, explodes as a supernova or just uses a laser and emits light in this direction. Now, if you have your observers here, they'll be never able to see anything uh, of that light. In the most striking situation, imagine that there is a mirror situation in this wedge. So there is a, a bunch of observers accelerating in the exactly opposite direction over here. You see, from the time equals to minus infinity all the way to plus infinity. Uh, they accelerate, they almost touch at the zero point, but not quite. Now, the interesting thing is that they will never able, they will never be able to see each other. You see, any photon emitted by these guys will be never registered by the one on the right-hand side, and any photon emitted on the right-hand side will never be registered by those observers on the, on the left-hand side. They never have any kind of information uh, they never exchange any information whatsoever. They never see each other's images. It's very strange. We're not used to this way of thinking. Uh, normally, we think that when we have a, a bunch of observers sending lines, they will always see each other, maybe with, with a little bit of, of time delay because of the finite light speed. But in special relativity, if you have this type of uniformly accelerating observer, it's absolutely possible that each of these two families of observers will never ever see each other. So it's not obvious at all that given two, given two observers in a space-time, even, even simple Minkowski space-time, uh, there will be any kind of causal contact between them. Uh, was this clear or do I need to give you more explanation? So I'm gonna ask some questions. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. This so so the thing is that I understand that uh, what you are trying to say over here, but then again, uh, is it also a bit more dependent on where we take the origin as? Because that is the point where the observer will see these observations or make uh, these kinds of. Uh, like what, do you, what, know, what do you mean by the origin? So yes, yeah, so, so the point of zero comma zero, which is there. So, so obviously, if, if we displace one of these, uh, so if we displace one of these uh, families of observers with respect to the other, so that they have mm -hmm. some kind of overlap, the effect will disappear. They will have a bit of overlap. They will see each other uh, for some time. So yeah, it, it, you have to you have to position these two groups of observers in a clever way, in order to see this effect. In yeah, so that they lose contact with each other. Then it's dependent on the coordinate system itself, right? Because what or more precisely, it's dependent no, on their yeah. position with respect to each other. Yes. Not so much on coordinate system, but on the position of these two groups with respect to each other. Each other. They have to be sufficiently far away from each other. They, they cannot overlap. They yes. cannot just get close to each other. Yeah, it was my mistake. Sorry. So what I wanted to say is it depends on the uh, observer who is seeing this effect or trying to observe this effect even though it might not be possible for the observer of origin to see any of these events maybe. What do you mean uh, by observer of origin? So there is, let's say an observer at zero comma zero. 
okay so with what four velocity observer. with this four velocity yes with that four velocity so it will observe these forms of events which is occurring at these two regions yes it, this observer will see everything yes uh, looking on the left the observer will see everything everything she or or, or he wants to see from uh any kind of light emitted from the observers on the right hand side and any kind of light emitted from the observers on, on, on the left on the left hand side left hand side yes so now my question goes in this way that given the scenario um in this frame of reference of the observer who is moving with this four velocity of like from zero comma zero uh, in this frame of reference this kind of effect the observer will say will be existent but when we change this origin at that time, we uh, like the observer observer who has a four velocity at that point might say a different story, right? Yes, uh, you mean simply displacing the origin? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it will be a bit different, but still, if this observer is inertial, he or she will see. I think he or she will see the light from all of those. So even if you if you put the observer over here, mm -hmm. and this is an inertial observer. Yeah. I believe he or she will see the light emitted by each of these particles at some point. But it's the peculiarity um, of, of of accelerating ones that they don't see everything. But will this uh, will uh, these two regions still be causally disconnected? Yes. At that uh, ca point? causal disconnection has nothing to do with any kind of third observer. Look. Okay. As, as simple as that. It's a geometric fact. Yes. Which is coordinate independent. Okay. Simply, there is no there is no connecting null geodesics between any point here and any point over there, and it doesn't yeah. depend on what what kind of coordinates you use to describe that. Okay. 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 So, the second big lesson from from this this coordinate system. So there are three lessons I would like you to draw from this coordinate system. So, in general, coordinate systems are not global. Interest physically interesting coordinate systems may just uh, cover only a part of your manifold. The second lesson is that uniformly accelerating observers behave in a slightly different way than in your Newtonian approximation. They do not really accelerate with exactly the same acceleration. Uh, and then, and the last message is that it's not obvious that that uh, observers, that the families of, of observers can see each other. It is possible that uh, only one family can see the other one, but not vice versa. It is possible that only uh the, the second one sees the first one but not vice versa and it's possible that they're entirely disconnected and never see each other even in very simple situations okay it's a good time for a break okay hello everyone uh so we're back with our lecture so there is one more coordinate transform i would like us to do and then we'll go on with um with a blackboard lecture so the last coordinate transform uh i would like to work on would be the uniformly rotating coordinates and the reason why i want to go through this example is that there is one slight difficulty with with it one that we haven't encountered before uh sorry coordinates uh, yes so we begin with our standard Minkowski space that's what it looks like and in the first move we introduce the polar coordinate system polar coordinates I think we have already done this example. So we have T rho phi z into T x y z with x being equal to rho cosine phi y being equal to rho sine phi. Dx is equal to d rho cosine phi minus rho sine phi d phi dy will be d rho sine phi plus rho cosine phi d phi sorry this is phi and then 
So the metric in the new coordinates is, well, the standard polar coordinates, the metric of the standard polar coordinates. So d rho squared plus rho squared d phi squared uh, plus d z squared. But that was the first step. Then the step two, we introduce a uniform rotation. So we introduce a new phi coordinate. Uh, so we go from t rho phi tilde z to t rho phi z uh, with a new coordinate. Uh, phi tilde equal to phi minus omega t. Omega is a constant parameter. So it corresponds to a, to a new parameter. So, so our new phi is related to the old phi by some kind of constant uh, rotation with, with the angular velocity omega. Okay, so in that case, d phi is just d phi tilde plus omega dt because phi is just phi tilde plus omega t. Omega is a constant parameter. And now we will perform the coordinate change. So the only coordinate we touch is actually phi. And there's only one term with this phi coordinate, which is rho squared d phi squared. So let's work on, let's try to express this new term in terms of new coordinates. That's rho squared. Uh, sorry, that was supposed to be the one without tilde rho. Yes. So rho d phi squared, this time over here is rho squared d phi tilde plus omega dt squared, which is rho squared d phi tilde squared plus rho squared omega squared dt squared plus the cross term to rho squared omega d phi dt. This thing over here. Now, uh, going back to the expression for the metric itself, uh, we will obviously have another term uh, with dt squared coefficient. So let's write it this way. This is dt squared minus one plus rho squared omega squared. Mm. d rho squared remains unchanged. Then there is this rho squared d phi tilde squared. Then there is this interesting cross term to rho squared omega d phi dt, and then dz squared survives as it used to be. Let me check this with my notes. Yes, right, correct, correct, correct. Okay, so this is the metric in, in our new coordinates, and one important change with respect to what all the problems, all the examples we were discussing before, is that we've got a cross term, which contains not just uh, we've got an off diagonal term in the metric, d phi dt. And now we have to handle this uh, term appropriately. And there is a bit of a, there is a small catch here. So we are interested in the representation of g mu nu as a, uh, mm, as a matrix, as a, as, as a tensor, as the components of a tensor. So let's try to write it here. So obviously we've got this diagonal terms, minus one plus omega square rho squared, one rho squared one. Uh, that's basically,
this, 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 and this. But then we have this cross term. And it's important to realize that this term is actually two terms in, 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 in this guise. What I mean is that actually it's G zero to D, let's say Y zero Y dy two plus G two zero D Y zero D Y two or that this is just two G zero two times D Y zero D Y two which means that this two prefactor here does not correspond to the to a prefactor two in the G zero two or G two zero component, but rather it represents the fact that we have that these two components have been sort of uh, taken together in this in this one single term. So when we go to the matrix representation over here, uh, we get zero rho square omega zero 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 rho square omega zero 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 so yeah there is no two prefactor over here it's just that there is two terms of this kind which create uh which create a new two coefficient and that's the this is the components of the metric in a uniformly rotating frame. Okay. It's time for, for another topic and an important one actually. Differentiating vectors and tensors and tensors in general coordinates. Uh, so we are still working just in flat space times. This time let this be R squared, so a two-dimensional plane. Uh, and in all these space times, we have a special coordinate systems called Cartesian coordinates. In this case, I will call them XA, A equal to one, two. But we can also introduce the polar coordinates. Mm. Given by R cosine phi, R sine phi. Uh, yes. Now let's think about the vectors, the basis associated with the Cartesian coordinates. We'll call the polar coordinates Y A bar. So basis of vectors in Cartesian coordinates. Uh, well, that, there's two of them. There's E1. I'm using a bold, uh, a bold one because this is, um, this is the index which uh, marks an appropriate uh, vector of the basis, not a coordinate. But this is basically one zero, and we've got E2, which is basically zero one in the Cartesian coordinates. So the X and Y vectors. Uh, but what happens if we express these vectors in our new polar coordinates? E1, let's say A bar. Uh, well, we have to multiply everything with the appropriate uh, Jacobian and in this case uh, I will not derive this I will just show what it looks like 
uh, that's basically uh, cosine phi sine phi minus one over r sine phi one over r cosine phi times one zero, which is cosine phi minus one over r sine phi. On the other hand, the second one is the same matrix, cosine phi, sine phi minus one over r sine phi, one over r cosine phi, zero one. Okay, so it takes the form of sine phi, one over r cosine phi. And that's interesting because in the Cartesian coordinates, these vectors were obviously constant in the sense that they had always constant uh, coordinates, but that's not true in the polar coordinates anymore. And this is actually vice versa as well. Uh, that's layer number 12. Uh, so we can define F zero to be the coordinate one zero in polar coordinates. Uh, it's sometimes denoted also by uh, D over R and F one would be the zero one in polar coordinates, that would be D phi. Uh, and we can transform them to be Cartesian coordinates and discover that F, sorry, it shouldn't be zero and one, it should be one and two. Uh, and we discover that F one, Uh, that will be cosine phi minus r sine phi sine phi minus r cosine phi times one zero, which is equal to cos phi sine phi. And the second basis vector of the polar coordinates, sorry, now we express them in Cartesian coordinates. Uh, so there is no bar, no bar here. And the second vector is, well, the same matrix times zero one, which is minus R sine phi, R cos phi or this you can write also as minus y x, and this would be x over r, y over r. And again, uh, vector which has vectors which have constant components in the polar coordinates do not have constant components in Cartesian coordinates. Let's make, let's draw a picture. That will, that will make things a little bit more clear, I guess. This is the standard Cartesian coordinates, and we've got the vector E1 and the vector E2. On the other hand, we've got the polar coordinates. That will be constant R circles. and the constant phi lines. Uh, and these guys, let's change the color to green. The constant, uh, the basis vector in this case, so this is F, F1 
F2. They look quite different. Obviously, they, they appear to depend on the, on the position very much. This will be F1 again, and this will be F2. And now, there, there, there appears a bit of a problem where we want to differentiate vectors. So how do we differentiate vectors and tensors? Uh, in the Cartesian coordinates, we would simply take a vector, xa. Uh, a would denote the coordinates in, in, in this Cartesian decomposition. So our vector x is just x1, e1, plus x2, e2. And we can just differentiate them one component by component, and we get x a differentiate with respect to b equal to dx a over d x b. Uh, the problem is that when we try to apply the same the same situation the same type of reasoning to the polar coordinate systems, uh, let's see what happens. Mm. What happens is that x is equal to x1, let's say bar f1 bar plus x2 bar f2 bar. Uh, and if we differentiate that, let's say term by term, uh, that's a bit like assuming that these guys, F1 and F2 are constant. We do, we, do not, we do not differentiate them, but that doesn't feel very much right. Uh, normally we think of constant vectors, we think of E1 and, and E2 as constant vectors. At each point, they have this, the same direction in the sense of being parallel and also the same size uh, in the sense of the, of its norm, and you cannot say this about f. So try to take derivatives component by component in the polar coordinates will will produce a strange result. It is as if we believed f to be constant from one point to another, and that's that's not the correct way to do it. So a solution of this problem is to define the proper or covariant derivative. Or the proper derivative as the derivative in which we assume these Cartesian vectors to be constant. Uh, how exactly do we do it? So imagine we are calculating the derivative of a vector in the polar coordinates. So uh, Let's say here, nabla b, we will write it this way, x a semicolon b. That's basically x1, f1. We are performing the composition in the uh, frame uh, in the polar coordinates. I will explicitly write, uh, also write the, the index corresponding to the component plus x2 f2 a bar. Now we differentiate this whole expression. So first of all, we differentiate this coefficient here and that's pretty easy. That's just uh, dx1 over d polar b bar uh, and here we have f1 bar a bar plus and now we've got another coefficient 
which is the covariant derivative of the, which is the derivative of this vector f uh, f one a b and the same goes for the second one f two a b and no plus x to bar f2 a b. Okay, so we have two types of terms. Uh, the terms which appear because we are just covariant, we were just differentiating the comp each of the components with respect to the coordinate b, uh, y, b. But there is also the derivative of the basis vectors themselves, which we have to somehow calculate using the Euclidean uh, using the Cartesian coordinates. Uh, let's now give these two terms a name. This one and that one. I think this is number 13. So we have uh, x a b is equal to, let's write it this way, x a b. This is the standard derivative, d x a over d y b uh, plus, and we go back over there. Plus, we will call we'll call this guy over here gamma a one b, and this guy over here gamma a two b. That's just the a component of the derivative of f two with respect to b. So now what we get is x a times gamma, let's say x c times gamma a c b. Uh, please compare these expressions, this one over here and that one over there. I have just written down the summation with respect to index one and two as a summation with respect to index I call c. And I just I'm just using this gamma as as a new way of of describing these co components of this derivative over here. Okay, so this thing over here is called the covariant or derivative. Uh, these things are also known as the connection coefficients, and we'll talk more about them in, in, the, in the incoming lecture. The bottom line is that now something very interesting happens. Whereas this guy over here, the matrix made of just of derivatives of x a with respect to y b does not transform like a proper tensor. We will see it later in, in, in the game. This thing here is a, is a proper one one tensor. Uh, we I will also introduce another. So so this is one uh, notation for the covariant derivative using a, a, a semicolon. But it's also very often written using uh, using the del operator in this way. That's precisely the same thing. It's just that some authors prefer this one, some authors prefer that one. 
there is a bit of a difference between these notations and it's easy to see if you apply differentiation twice so if you differentiate this again with respect to c uh, you can see that these derivatives act in a different order here this what we have written here means that we first differentiate with respect to b and after that we differentiate the result with respect to c uh, but if we if we use this del notation we're using a prefix type of notation where the first differentiation is the last we we denote and the last differentiation is the first one we denote uh, so we first act with with the differentiation with differentiation with respect to b on on xa and then only then uh, we take the derivative with respect to c the order of indices b and c is obviously different in the two notations uh, you can play exactly the same game for one forms and if you differentiate a one form then the covariant derivative so again i remind you the derivative in which we assume the cartesian vectors to be constant in any other coordinate system it consists again of the standard derivatives of the coordinates but we also have to this time add a slightly different term but a, a bit of a similar one We are using basically the same set of coefficients, but we have to contract it a little differently. Instead of contracting uh, the upper index of our vector with the lower index of, of this gamma, we take the lower index of this kappa and contract it with the upper one. And the same goes for a more complicated tensor. We will not derive it right here. If you want to calculate the proper derivative in a non-Cartesian coordinate of, of a tensor, no, I'm using a different one. Let's say P. Here we have A, B, C, D. Then you take the standard derivative first. with respect to p and then you need to add more terms more gamma terms xp then you add the same type of term for the second index uh, B X B, and then you subtract the terms corresponding to lower indices so you get DAB X D gamma X C D and then you do the same thing with each of the lower indices uh this is the way you calculate the proper derivatives or the covariant derivatives of tensors in non-cartesian coordinates they perfectly agree with the uh, with the derivative in, in cartesian coordinates in cartesian coordinates the vectors ea are con uh, are constant and there is no gamma terms the derivative the covariant derivatives are just the standard one in curved in, in coordinate systems which are more complicated you have this, these gamma coefficients coming from the derivation of the basis vectors. Okay, any questions? Again, there will be a lecture about that just coming soon. But at the moment, I just want to show you that in a, in, in a standard flat space time, if you introduce more complicated coordinate system, differentiations of tensor and, and vectors involves adding this type of terms related to the derivatives of basis vectors. Uh, it seems there are no questions here so let me go to the slides okay so the topic of the lecture will be pseudo-Riemannian manifolds 
this is another differential geometry lecture. Uh, so we begin with a manifold. We assume we have a manifold over here described by coordinate charts. And we have a symmetric non-degenerate metric tensor at every point here, which is also sufficiently regular in the sense that you can we can take whichever derivative we want uh, of this tensor field. Now, uh, there is an old theorem in, in linear algebra called the Sylvester's law of inertia, which basically tells you that you can always find a basis at each of, of, of the tangent spaces here in which this metric will take a particularly convenient form, uh, a canonical form, uh, in which it is a diagonal matrix with a number of entries equal to minus one and a number of entries equals to plus one. There will be K uh, negative and L positive ones. Uh, the sum of K and L is equal to the dimension of the manifold. Since the metric is supposed to be non-degenerate, there is no possibility of zeros. In this Sylvester's theorem, actually, there is also possibility of zeros, but we assume that our metric is non-degenerate, invertible as a matrix. So there's just possibility of minus ones and plus ones. And it's important to realize that the number of plus and minuses is an invariant. In any other diagonalizing basis, we'll have the same number of minuses and the same number of pluses. So this, uh, this pair of numbers, K and L, somehow describes our metric. It's called signature. If our metric has just positive uh, entries, plus ones in its, in its canonical form, we call the signature of the metric Euclidean. It simply means that in appropriate coordinates, in appropriate basis, the product of vectors is what we expect to be a product, just sum of products of components. And because of that, the standard uh, Pythagorean theorem works and everything is basically as we have learned at school or at undergraduate courses. Uh, if we're dealing with a manifold of dimension four, and this is the, the, the case we will be mostly dealing with here, and we have one negative sign, minus one, and three positive one, ones, we call the signature Lorentzian. And that's what our we will be dealing with space-time which have this type of signature. Typically, we assume that the signature is constant throughout the whole space-time. Uh, continuity does not really actually allow any changes of, of uh, signature uh, between neighboring points. So yeah, we assume that everywhere we have the signature of minus plus 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 one. Okay, so we have a metric. What can we do with that? Uh, one interesting thing we can do is to introduce a object called connection or a couple of related objects called covariant derivative and parallel transport. So let me begin by stating that in a manifold, tensors and vectors live at, at different points, live in different vector spaces. We cannot add them, we cannot subtract them. It's not like in, in, in the Minkowski space or on a, on a flat plane that we can move our vectors around, compare them uh, easily, even if they live in different points. However, it's still, we would still like to compare tensors at least at infinitesimally displaced points. Uh, without a metric, there is no preferred way to do it. But fortunately, there is a special machine which does this job called connection. And connection is basically a machine for comparing vectors, tensors, and other types of objects between points which are very close to each other, infinitesimally close. Uh, it's related very closely to three other uh, important uh, objects. Another object called parallel transport, maybe we'll get to that. An object called covariant derivative. And an object called the choice of the local inertia frame. We'll explore exactly what these what these links actually mean geometrically and how what they mean physically later in this lecture. At the moment, please just remember that connection is an abstract thing which allows us to compare tensors, but it gives much more than that. It, it lets us transport vectors from one place to another. Uh, it will also allow us to calculate derivatives. And on top of that, it will be related to the choice of the local inertial frame. 
where do we get a connection from? Well, in, in a manifold without any additional structures, there's infinite, infinitely many connections we can, we can use. But if we have a non-degenerate metric, there is a special connection called Levi Civita or metric connection, which is in a sense compatible with the metric we have. And this is in fact, the only connection we will deal with uh, in this lecture. It's by far the most important example of connection in differential geometry. The one which comes from the metric we have already on our manifold. Uh, so how do we choose a connection? So the idea is to choose the covariant derivatives of basis vectors. We've got our coordinate system, a coordinate chart in our manifold. It doesn't have to be global. At each point, this gives us the basis vectors EA and the uh, basis of covectors, omega nu. I'm sorry, this should be an upper index. My mistake. Let me correct it right away. Uh, and now what we do is just assume that the covariant derivative in an appropriate direction of our uh, vector sigma hat. Uh, hat is basically what used to be uh, a bold index in, in my board lecture. Unfortunately, it's difficult to make bold, uh, bold face indices in uh, keynote presentations, as I found out a couple of days ago. So I have to use a hat over here. But it simply means that this is not an coordinate index, it's an index which, uh, which marks the, the, the vectors of, of a basis. So we take vector number sigma, we take its derivative in direction mu, and we decompose the result in, the, uh, in our uh, basis, obtaining the coefficients, which we will call the connection coefficients. And then it's relatively easy to prove that the, if we take the appropriate covector basis related to this one, the covariant derivatives of this co-basis has a very similar uh, expansion in terms of the basis of the covectors. We will call gamma the connection coefficients. If we do it this way, and then we can define the covariant derivative of the or the proper derivative of every vector, uh, which we denote either by this del operator or by the semicolon. And this is basically the standard derivative of each component, component by component, plus a term related to the connection coefficients. Basically, we take this only free index. Uh, we contract it with the index of the connection. Uh, yeah, and the last index is the direction in which we differentiate. And the same for covectors. For scalars, because scalars are also a very special type of tensors, we simply state that the covariant derivative of a scalar is just the standard derivative of a scalar. We take the derivative with respect to each component and do nothing else. It turns out that this is important for consistency purposes. For general tensor, we've got this general formula we talked about on the blackboard. So we take the derivative component by component, but then for each component on uh, uh, for each index, uh, each upper index and each lower index, we have to uh, add or subtract an appropriate product with the gamma. And these formulas are, are on, on the yellow background because they're quite important. And I'm afraid you will need to learn them by heart. Uh, they look a bit complicated, but when you think about it, they, they are very simple in the sense that uh, there's a, a very simple scheme you can use to see uh, how this works. So in the end, in order to, to, to calculate covariant derivatives, we somehow have to choose these, these coefficients gamma mu alpha, which give us the covariant derivatives of the basis vectors in a particular coordinate system. Uh, before, we, before I will state how we, we, we got our connection from the metric, let me just mention that if we change our coordinates from X to Y, uh, this means that we have our Jacobian lambda equal dy over dx and the inverse one dx over dy. We can calculate the transformation law for the connection coefficients. It turns out that it partially 
transforms as we would expect from a tensor. So there is an appropriate Jacobian term for each of these indices here. However, there's an additional term which contains the second derivative of the uh, coordinate functions y with respect to x or the derivative of the Jacobian, the first derivative of the Jacobian. And something that transforms this way is not a tensor. Connections, is, connections are not tensor, they transform differently. The transformation law involves the second derivatives of our coordinate system with respect to the previous coordinate system. Something that transforms this way is not a tensor. But that's actually a pretty good thing. Because if you, re if you remember the, the, uh, the coordinate change or law for, for vectors, what you do is just you, you multiply each component by you 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 take a product of an, of the matrix lambda with x. The standard derivative component by component of of this vector transforms again in a rather ugly way. There will be a, a derivative of of lambda appearing here pretty obviously. So what can we do with that? So, so the standard derivative of a vector with respect to a component is not a tensor either, but if you take these two guys together, so this thing here and gamma multiplied by x, you can check very carefully that you can check easily that the this offending terms actually cancel each other out, and this guy over here is actually a tensor. So indeed, if we have a connection, something that transforms with this this transformation law under coordinate transforms, we can truly differentiate tensors, uh, obtaining tensors of higher valence, obtaining objects which transform appropriately. Uh, any questions? Um, so I just have one question over here. So when we are talking about these transformations, uh, at this point, so for example, over here, we see that this, uh, this normal derivative is not a tensor, whereas the covariant derivative is a tensor, right? Yes. So is the covariant derivative defined in such a way that we get these uh, normal derivatives to be a tensor or is it yes. something? Okay. Yes, that's a way to, that's one way to look at that. So the, in differential geometry, there's very often many ways in which you can look at particular objects. But I think the, 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 the first intuition is that this is a derivative in which we make sure that uh, the object we get is a tensor of a slightly higher valence. We get just one okay. more lower index. Yeah, because these we are actually doing it with respect to some form of coordinate transformation of these vectors as well, right? So like, yes. for example, if I have a vector, I will do a coordinate transformation. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that transformation itself is not a tensor, then that might have created a problem. The transformation that... cannot be a tensor, the effect of transform. Okay, yeah, you yeah, have yeah. a geometric object. A geometric object mm -hmm. is a set of numbers which depends on your coordinate system. If yes. it does not transform appropriately, it is not a tensor. And okay. we would like to have some kind of yeah. method of differentiating, which is uh, which satisfies all the properties of differentiation, mm -hmm. but which yes. produces true tensors. And this must be a covariant derivative. You have to include, in general, this type of gamma coefficients, which transform in this strange way. Okay. Uh, we It's already 11. So in the next part of the lecture, I will tell you how you, how you get your connection from the metric. Uh, but I think this is all for today. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any last minute questions to the lecture? Anybody else wants to ask a question? Okay, I don't see anyone. In that case, thank you very much. Uh, and see you next week on Tuesday. Thank you very much.